And today, Joanne Barwise is with us with Fire Smart Gardening. Joanne is a graduate of the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. She is also a certified pollinator steward from Pollinator Partnership Canada. And she raises both honeybees and the gardens that support native bees. She also presented a pollinator workshop for us last year. Isn't that right, Joanne? Yes. She, yes, she's enjoyed a long career as an environmental educator, and she's published many articles and a book. So without further ado, here is Joanne with Fire Smart Gardening. Hi, Hi Joanne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kendra and April, for doing the presentation. Uh, welcome to the session, Be Fire Smart Gardening Practices to Protect Your Home. Uh, I, when I started uh, doing research on this, uh, when we talk about gardening, I couldn't, and fire, you, they're, they're intermixed, so it was hard to separate uh, gardening and um, Fire Smart. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, this is a partnership program, as already said, between the Master Gardeners and the Regional Library. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge that I live on the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish, the Snunimuk, the Kowachan, the Shamanis, uh, and the Hokominam Treaty Group. Uh, this seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island and the Master Gardeners program. It's in a recording and will be uh, available on uh, the YouTube channel from the library. I've tried to source all the images I can. Uh, they're used for educational purposes. So I thank everybody for their generosity uh, in, for this educational event. So uh, Fire Smart is it's a timely uh, subject. Uh, Friday, a budget came out. Uh, they're putting, the province is putting $359 million towards fighting wildfires and $90 million of that uh, has been budgeted for Fire Smart. Um, Fire Smart, um, th this is uh, the boots on the ground program. We know it's also timely because our climate is changing. Uh, we have drier conditions now and the wildfires are becoming more frequent. Now wildfires are a natural uh, component of the, the ecosystems in um, British Columbia, they help maintain diversity. Uh, they provide nutrients to the ground and help plants reproduce and also provide habitat for animals. But because of climate change, um, conditions are changing, it's becoming hotter and drier and for longer periods, thus creating a longer fire season. So the session outline of today is, uh, I want to bring awareness to the Fire Smart program. Uh, I'm an advocate of the program, but I am not a representative of the program nor uh, uh, an, an employee. I come to this as an environmental educator, uh, as a past, and my, with my education lens, I'm trying to pull pieces together uh, to make it uh, more understandable for everybody. Um, so uh, it's just the basics. Um, today. You'll know where you stand with, with the program. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about fire behavior because both of these two things, Fire Smart Program and Fire Behavior, in, inform the plants that you will use in, and how you will landscape your property. I want you to, I'm always like to use mnemonic devices, things that help you remember. I've used the fire, uh, the triangle here and the bullseye. Uh, there's two triangles for you to remember. If you get anything out of the program today, it's the two triangles and four circles. And, and there's two important words coming throughout the session. And I'll let you know when I hit each one of them. So you don't have much to remember, uh, but I hope these hang on to you. So uh, the size behind the Fire Smart, it, it, it's indisputable. Uh, it's a Canadian standard recognized across this country. Uh, it's evolved over 40 years. It's backed by a vast amount of uh, modeling research and field research. Uh, and the guidelines in the FireSmart program are proven to be legitimate as measures of a hazard. So 
the methods that I'll be putting forward have been demonstrated time and time again to reduce uh, your risk of loss under even the most extreme um, fire conditions. Now, I used to live in Alberta and I moved to BC. Why would I move here? Because it's so beautiful, it's supernatural BC. And of course, we all love the wilderness and the trees. And when we talk about some of the fire smart principles, it may conflict with your values and desires of living in the country, or planning your dream vacation cottage. You know, uh, the trees and nature around us give us a sense of privacy and living on the land and getting away from it all. Uh, and we also uh, like not to spend too much time uh, on yard work. So there's a bit of a conflict, but um, you're going to see you'll have some inner dialogue through the whole thing with yourself. You're going to have a talk with yourself about this. So here's one of the triangles. Uh, when I learned to make campfires, uh, you need a match. And in this case, it would be heat, uh, oxygen, and fuel. And if you watch Survivor on TV and they have to do those fire challenges, they have lots of fuel and they give them the spark and then they blow on the fire. You cannot have a fire if one of those elements is missing. Uh, if there's no combustion or heat, Oxygen and fuel by itself don't do anything. If there's no oxygen, heat and fuel won't do anything. Uh, all three components are necessary. So the idea in Fire Smart and in landscaping uh, for Fire Smart is to remove one of the elements. And there's only one element in here that you have control over. And I hope you're saying the bottom one, fuel. And that's the first word that you need to remember is fuel throughout this whole presentation. The second triangle um, is noteworthy as well, because this is about fire behavior. So the way a fire behaves is uh, based on the land, the topo topography, whether it's flat or mountainous or sloped or hilly. Uh, it depends on weather. We hear that time and again. Is it windy? Is it uh, the wind comes up and can influence fires? And of course, uh, there's that word fuel. So the one here, the one component of this fire behavior triangle that we have control over, it's not necessarily the land or the weather, but it's certainly about the fuel. And that's where we need to concentrate our efforts, the fuel around our home. So some of the factors that affect the fire behavior um, triangle is um, on the right is topography. You can see going up a hill. When a fire goes up a hill, it pre-dries what's up there and it just likes to travel up there. And if you live on the top of a hill, uh, it's recommended that you live 10 meters from the crest, away from the crest of a hill, because you'll certainly be overtaken if you're at the top of a, of a hill like that. Um, and also uh, the pictures on the left, uh, the top picture, you can see uh, lots of fuel under the trees, some of them almost touching. That's fuel. The fuel ignites, goes up the tree. And then you're talking about crown fires. I'll get into that later. Um, but they can produce uh, lots of embers that can travel up to two kilometers. And that's the other word you have to remember today our embers. See, you're done already, but not really. Okay, here we go. So uh, one of the big things is um, fire ladders. And uh, fire ladders is when the fire is spreading along the bottom of the, uh, uh, on the surface of the ground, and it has fuel to climb to the top of the trees. And now you're in from a surface fire to a crown fire. And that's where you get lots of um, uh, offshoots of the fire that go right up into the air. And these crown fires, uh, even though both these kind of fires produce lots of embers, the crown fires, they catapult embers, as I said, up to two kilometers away. So we have to be aware that underneath, not to create these fire ladders and to keep things clean under our trees and to keep the fuel away 
so that embers are not created. So we see here that under the trees, they are cleared away up to two meters. And the fire would just be a surface fire in this case. So just another look at how uh, fires travel. Uh, on the left, you have a direct fire contact uh, going right from the trees to shrubs right to the house, okay? Uh, then you have radiant, and radiant is when, okay, you've got ambers that would uh, connect to uh, a shed or an outbuilding that's quite close to your house that would create enough radiant heat uh, to, and remember we said in the beginning it would be a match or heat, it, heat uh, radiant heat will also um, cause fire, and there you, your house is on fire just from embers, setting a, a shed on fire and then radiant heat hitting the house. And also there's embers again, just flying through the air and landing where they want. So we have to surround our houses with um, uh, some good gardening practices on landscaping. Fire doesn't matter, it's all fuel and uh, it's just, just gonna go where it's gonna go. So one of the terms you will hear uh, is wildland urban interface. And you might be saying, well, am I at risk uh, for wildfire? And you should probably know, uh, it's, it's easy to see um, that if you have fuel around your house, um, especially at the top, you've got, um, um, I can't read it, interface and, and intermix. Um, these trees on the top, can ignite all those homes on the left and the same with the intermix on the bottom. Um, as I said, fire doesn't care, it's just gonna go where it wants to go. So on FireSmart, um, these are the circles we're talking, we're gonna go into next, the circles that I want you to remember, the four circles. What is the circle? Uh, and I've identified it as a bullseye because right at the center of the bullseye is your home. And that's the first circle is the perimeter of your home. Um, and that's called, uh, that's the critical, the most critical. And that's what you want to be non-combustible. Um, your second critical uh, zone is uh, up to 10 meters from your home. So that's the second circle, third circle. And I'll go through each of these zones. Uh, sometimes I see zone 1A as zero and then zone one, it, it doesn't matter. Just remember home and then up to 10 meters, 10 to 30, and then 30 to 100. So let's talk about the home for a minute. Uh, this is the most critical area. We, want it, we don't want anything combustible near the home. So access your roof. Uh, see if it, you need maintenance, if there's anything up there. Is it fire resistant or do you have fire retardant? Install a spark uh, rester on the chimney so that there's no sparks uh, getting away, escaping. Keep your gutters clean. Uh, if you can't reach them or you get lost in debris, you can get screened for your guttering uh, to reduce the volume that gets accumulated there quite easily. Assess your eaves and your vents. Um, and embers will get into the vents into your attic. So make sure you've got a three millimeter uh, wire mesh that uh, covers your vents. Use fire resistant siding, stucco, metal siding, brick, concrete. I hope you're thinking about your home as we're going through this. Because some of them you'll be fine and some of them you've got to consider. Uh, fire resistant windows, um, Thermal double paned windows are recommended. Single pane uh, have little resistance from the heat. Make sure your doors are fire re, uh, rated and that they're well sealed. Clean under your decks. Uh, believe it or not, uh, embers will collect under your decks because they're blowing around and um, your deck would be fuel uh, to ignite your home. Uh, fencing. Your fencing, if it's wooden, should be 1.5 meters from your home. Uh, maintain the outside of your home to make sure everything is tidy. And don't forget about the outbuildings. Uh, outbuildings should be at least 10 meters. Now, as I was going through this, I was thinking, you know, when 
you're building a home and you get a building code, some of the building codes don't coincide with this. So um, I would suggest anyone who's thinking about building a home to look at the fire smart uh, requirements first, which I wish we had done when we moved. So let's have a look at this home. Uh, yes or no, uh, that's a no-no. Uh, accumulate. That's a lovely fuel source, isn't it? No, uh, clean and tidy uh, away from the home. Uh, a lot of gutters, accumulation of uh, fuel, so they should be cleaned. Now here's the before and after picture. Um, they uh, put against the house gravel and taken away uh, the plants that would be could easily ignite. And then I don't know what they've done on the left side, but uh, I see more pots on the right. And so containers are a good a fire smart strategy uh, for gardening. Uh, the one on the left with the lattice, unless that's fire uh, resistant, could be a, a fire ladder as well. Uh, this house has uh, uh, containers, which is a good strategy. Uh, there's cement right up against the house, there's no fuel. And this one on the left looks like it's uh, been zero scaped. It's got drought tolerant plants and they're probably fire resistant. So it's just a matter of cleaning up. So it's recommended that when you build your house that you do use, you pave instead of build. Um, I've already told you about the embers being a problem with decks. So try to keep something. And of course th their furniture here is metal as well. So this used to be quite the fad in the old days, putting junipers and cedars up against the house. Uh, but that's uh, a, f a good fuel source. So uh, clean it up and put in some uh, landscaping stones and um, so that you have that uh, non-combustible zone right around your house. Now, uh, this reminds me, the telephone pole, um, utility lines and things. Um, if you're having problems with vegetation around some of your lines, you can call it the line companies and they'll uh, clean it up. So let's move out a little bit uh, farther from immediately around the house. Now we'll go into the yard. So in your yard, uh, this is where you're gonna start making your smart choices for plants and shrubs and grasses and mulches. Just remember to think fire resistant plants and I will go into that more later. Uh, begin your uh, landscaping um, about 10 meters. Use low growing, well-spaced uh, shrubs and plants and make sure you maintain that 1.5 meter non-combustible zone around your house. Uh, grass, a good fire resistant lawn is a mowed lawn. So keep your lawn mowed about 10 centimeters, which is probably about four inches. Uh, so you can go lower than that, but don't go any higher than uh, four inches. Mulch, I have a whole slide later on mulch, but make sure you don't put any woody mulch uh, against your house and consider gravel as surrounding your house. Uh, fire piles, um, that's, oh, sorry, <laughs> firewood piles. Um, so make sure they're not against your house. I know we like to have the firewood right right next door, but you're gonna to have to keep it as far away as your shed is because that's a big fuel source for a fire. Uh, your burn barrels and your uh, should be as far away from the house and you should be following uh, fire bands when it comes to burn barrels and fire pits. Uh, fire tools, make sure you have um, some garden hoses, sprinklers, ladders, anything, shovels, rakes, just know where they are and keep them together. And again, I mentioned power lines, utility companies could do that, for you, uh, do that for you. So that was circle number two. So here's an example of a wood pile or I wouldn't call it a fire wood pile, but clean it up because that's fuel right under the deck and wouldn't an ember just love to get in there and have a party. So clean it up, tidy it up, put some gravel in. So being fire smart is being clean and tidy. So um, 
So at this zone, 10 to uh, 30 minutes, the next one out, uh, we're getting further out, uh, is the spacing of trees. Your trees at this point should be three meters apart. Uh, you removed all the combustibles, the low hanging branches, uh, bring them up to two meters high. Uh, don't think about ladders so that there's nothing underneath that's going to travel up to the top of a tree. Uh, roads and driveways, make sure you have an escape plan and that a fire truck can come into your driveway or that you have uh, two entrances and two, two exits. Uh, that's a good thing to know uh, if you're building a house in the, in the country. And uh, this is a big one to me is uh, your neighborhood. When you getting further away from uh, your home, uh, your neighbors uh, should be getting involved in any plans that you have for landscape and in trimming and pruning around your home. So I'll, I'll talk more about that later. So I want you to look at this home and I'll ask Kendra to uh, field, um, is it this one? No, oh, I think I'm okay on this one. Um, this is uh, a fire smart home. Uh, it's been, uh, you see the landscaping, it could be zero escaped here, paved driveway, paved walk, and of course there's probably pebbles up against the home. They've got deciduous trees in the front. The landscaping is 10 meters away. And then they've got thinning around the back of the house. So it looks clean and tidy. And this is why you want it clean and tidy uh, because um, you, your house doesn't have to look like a moonscape to survive a fire like this. This house is surrounded by, it looks like deciduous trees, uh, a water feature, a mowed lawn. Yeah. So the bigger zone, um, 30 to 100 meters out, uh, does involve your neighborhood and your community. So um, this is where you need to talk to the fire smart um, officers and experts who can help you uh, get a community program going and um, work together. So, and you do need the, the information from experts on this particular area. So when it comes to tree pruning, make sure you have that two meter uh, clearance, you, you can have um, plants, low plants under your trees, as long as you've created enough height between the plant and the foliage uh, of the tree. So um, you can just follow the guidelines that you need, lots of clearance. This is an American uh, picture that I have here. I've tried to do some conversions down here in the corner. Uh, and I chose this for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is it shows a house on a piece of property and the circles are now ovals because that could be the size of the property. It could be long and narrow. It doesn't show the full circle because, uh, and you have to consider the circles because you don't know what your neighbor is doing. And that neighbor is part of that circle. Uh, your, your 30, your um, 10 meter circle, your 20 meter circle. So uh, it's really important that you involve the people on all around you when you're talking about pruning and those fire ladders and the fuel and keeping it tidy. But I like this because uh, it shows the spacing within the zones uh, between the trees. Uh, 18 feet is um, six meters, about six meters apart here. Uh, 12 feet, it gets less so. Um, and then you've got a result. Uh, so that would be six, uh, four, and then about two meters here. But you can see they've all been pruned up and there's no fuel underneath. Uh, so it's just a cleaner woods that you have around your house. Um, you can only control the spheres around your house, but when they start interfering with, with other people, then you need to talk to your neighbors. And that's why it's really important. And that's why Fire Smart is sort of a, a community program. So, um, 
there's some embers in the air uh, who have landed very close to this house, looks like wooden shingles, and they've got some fuel right next to the house. Uh, embers is that second word, fuel, and ember are the two words I want you to remember because 50% of home fires are burned because of the uh, because of embers, uh, and they can travel quite far from a large fire. So uh, it's very important to be fire smart. Uh, I lived in Alberta uh, at the time when uh, Fort McMurray had their big fire, and I found this really interesting paper. Uh, and if you want it, you can um, just fire off an email to April, and I'll, I'll send it to you or take a screenshot of this. Uh, but it uh, talks about six fire pathways. And this is really important, uh, I thought, for us to know as uh, gardeners and landscapers. So the first one is you have this huge uh, fire. It's all consuming um, crown fire. And you've got embers that are traveling. They travel to the leaves, which ignite, which travel to the evergreens. It gets hot. You've got this radiant heat. Uh, the deck uh, catches fire and the house burns. Now, these were proven to be pathways in Fort McMurray. Uh, the one on the bottom, this one has a uh, wildflower. The embers uh, are taken by the wind. Uh, go to a wood chip mulch uh, where it smolders. It climbs up onto the ornamental junipers and cedars. Remember, against the house, it's so passe. Don't do that anymore. And uh, the radiant heat uh, ignites the deck, uh, and then, of course, uh, your house is on fire. Here's another one. You get a big fire. The embers are traveling into dried grass. They start burning. It catches on the wooden fence, which goes to the evergreens, and the, it's a big fire. Radiant heat catches the shed, which is a little too close to the home, probably, and then uh, that's on fire, and the house catches on fire. Uh, the fourth way is a uh, wildflower with the embers traveling, two leaves to a firewood pile, which is right next to some fuel cans somebody left out for their ATVs or whatever that catches fire and then that uh, spreads to the, ignites the house. So number five is you've got uh, embers from a large fire uh, going to uh, some wood chips. Uh, going to uh, spread into um, a lumber pile. The radiant heat sets the shed on fire. Uh, the flames uh, spread to the deck and then the home ignites and burns. This last one they caught on video and this particular path took 45 seconds. Uh, the wildflower, uh, the wild fire uh, flames uh, so there were no embers with this one. This was a flame that went right into the dried grass, uh, uh, catching the junipers, uh, which are not fire resistant, the radiant heat, and the house caught on fire. So you may think you have time. You don't. 45 seconds is not enough time. So what are some of the characteristics of highly flammable plants? Well, they are the coniferous. The have uh, resins and oils, they've got loose papery barks, they accumulate fine, dry, dead material that they're always good to start a fire with when you're camping. And they have aromatic uh, leaves and needles. And, and so if you don't know the difference uh, between coniferous and deciduous, uh, if you crush the, le uh, the leaves or the needles are leaves, uh, and it has a very uh, high odor, uh, it smells like pine and sap, uh, then you know um, it's a highly flammable plant. Uh, coniferous trees should not be planted. They should be at least 10 meters away if you have them. They're uh, highly flammable um, plants. So let's go into some plants to avoid. Um, I, I think this Pompous grass is quite funny because when I took master gardening, the, the teacher said, oh, I really like pompous grass. She said, oh, that's so 19s, 1980s. I thought, oh, okay. But uh, it's not a good idea. Look how light and feathery it is. It's uh, certainly a fuel for an ember to catch. Uh, broom, there's pine, juniper, holly. Fountain grass, oh, that's another one that uh, can easily catch. Nice fuel there. 
cedar used spruce and some other plants to avoid acacia, bamboo, uh, cedar, cypress, eucalyptus, fountain grass, juniper, pine. And of course the invasives, which are not uh, fire resistant, scotch broom, English ivy, uh, blackberry, holly, knotwood, Japanese honeysuckle and reed canary grass. Now I did leave you a handout uh, that went with this presentation. It's a fire smart list of all the plants you can use uh, for your home. Now fire resistant does not mean fireproof. There's no fireproof plants, but what it does mean is that uh, they are slow to burn and they don't easily spread um, fire uh, from one to another. Um, so you still have to keep them maintained and you have to keep them uh, well watered. So, so let's look at the characteristics of fire resistant plants. So they're moist, they have supple leaves. All these trees at the bottom, they're deciduous trees. Uh, they have leaves, not needles. They have very little accumulation of uh, dead matter under the trees that come from the tree itself. Uh, they have sap uh, that doesn't smell uh, like some of the coniferous trees do. And they don't have that resin. You know, on uh, coniferous trees, a lot of them bubble and leave resin bubbles on the outside, which are great for starting fires, uh, but also forest fires. So here are some of the plants you can use. Uh, some of the annuals uh, that are supple and Moist, they have moisture in them, geraniums, dusty miller, pansies, salvia, snapdragon, sunflowers. Uh, some of the bulbs are crocus, daffodil, uh, lily, nodding onion. I didn't put in tulip. Tulip's a good one, but I know the deer like them, so I didn't put it in. Uh, good ground cover, these succulent plants like hen and chips, stone crop. Some of the perennials. Uh, Burgonia, hostas, lamb's ear, lavender, red hot poker, yarrow, vanilla leaf, and showy milkweed. And a lot of these are native plants, which means they belong in the landscape and they're probably drought resistant, perfect for pollinators. Uh, Swordford is a native plant. Azalea, black currant, the nook of rose, ocean spray, red huckleberry, red azure dogwood, native plants. Uh, Salal, tall oregon grape seed. Look, it's already got a pollinator on there. Thimbleberry, twinberry, native plants. Uh, some of the trees willow, uh, red alder, apple trees, dogwood, uh, cascara, pin cherries. Sitka Mountain Ash, any of the leaf trees. And as I said, you do have uh, that uh, list I, as a handout. There's so much information on FireSmart, you will, you will find everything you need. I am just creating awareness for you. So when it comes to water use, consider zero scaping. And what they like to say is, if it ain't pretty, it ain't zero scaping. Zero scaping is a way of gardening uh, that uses fire resistant landscaping. It uses fire resistant plants. Uh, it reduces turf um, and the mulches are very, it, you're not mulching with chip uh, and it does not sacrifice beauty uh, to prevent fire. So uh, if you live in a dry area, this is a really good way to consider um, gardening around your home with, is with zero scape. And also when you choose fire smart plants, uh, group your water requirements together. If, if plants that need to be water adopted, group them together uh, and also have some of those that are drought tolerant, which would be your native plants and some that are special for zero scape. So this was a really good, uh, page I came upon uh, for gardeners. Uh, and like I said, FireSmart has everything you need. So um, it has, I can't see the top of my screen. Oh yes, it's the plant hardiness zone. 
So I live in uh, Ladysmith and I know I live in uh, plant hardiness zone eight. And so I live somewhere down in here. I, uh, you can find your zone. You go to this one right here, uh, firesmart.ca, landscaping hub, fire resistant plants. Even if you forget that, uh, take a screenshot. Uh, but you, as I said, you'll find everything you need. So what I did was I selected my zone. So it was pink on the map, uh, eight here. But look what it does for me. It, I can pick, pull out all the trees that I can plant in my zone that are fire, fire resistant, shrubs, vines and ground covers, grasses, perennials and biennials, annuals and bulbs. You couldn't ask for anything more. Plus a virus, fire smart has a landscaping guide. So um, the win-win for everybody. Okay, so let's talk about mulch, mindfully mulch. So plant-based mulches uh, can be flammable. Uh, so don't use them next to your house. Uh, so that could be bark or evergreen needles. Uh, use gravel or rock mulches next to your, to your home. And you can also use mature compost. Mature compost is fire smart. It's also good gardening and it's what master gardeners recommend uh, is compost. So let's talk about landscaping. Uh, look at the house on the right. Uh, that was before they had a fire smart education. So we'll compare the two, we'll hop back and forth. So there's a lot of trees uh, on the house on the right. And I know that landscapers use this kind of tree to represent coniferous trees. And they use uh, this for the leaf trees, the deciduous trees. So they did a massive pruning, uh, kept a lot of the large deciduous trees and really took out a lot of the coniferous because that is, that's really high fuel uh, and fires love them. Uh, they took the landscaping from the front of the house and they moved it away and surrounded the house with gravel. Then they took the plants from the patio and they put them in containers around the patio. Um, I don't know what this, that's probably, I, I don't know what that is. I couldn't figure it out. Uh, but it, in any case, it could have been a planter, but they've done maybe put a bench or something there. I'm not sure. They, uh, but the patio could have been changed. If the patio has not been changed, one of the things you have to do is put a skirting around the patio so the embers, uh, you stop at least the embers getting under there to um, ignite the wooden, wooden deck, and of course the front too. So you have a lot of pruning to do. Um, you might get a sense that you're losing some privacy, but you're saving your most valued, uh, your biggest investment of your life, which is your home. And it could be your dream home. So let's look at some of the things that people have done. Uh, this to me looks like a zero scaping, probably drought tolerant plants, big sidewalk, nothing big and large um, in the front of this house, took the lawn out. Uh, this looks like zero scaping too, where they've got big pathways, uh, low bushes, drought tolerant. Now this house has a fence and that fence looks farther away than 1.5 meters. They've also got some plants out there too. Um, it looks like cement all the way around, um, probably gravel uh, that looks like gray gravel, pea gravel perhaps in the landscaping in the front or compost and a deciduous tree in the front. Uh, one of the tactics you can use if you love to garden is to plant an island. Create an island away from your home. Uh, this particular one is in the middle of a nicely mowed lawn, less than four inches, I can tell. Um, and uh, low, low fuel or uh, low foliage. And this one here has cement all the way around. It's probably a back deck. But you still can have a beautiful, beautiful yard uh, being fire smart. This looks like zero scape, as does this one on the left. Beautiful containers and pots. 
uh, sidewalks, uh, lots of stone. Um, this one looks a little bushy in the front, but if that's a drought tolerant tree, uh, uh, fire resistant, sorry, uh, it, it might be fine. Uh, another strategy to use is uh, rock walls. Uh, we have one in our yard and you can plant, plant beautiful plants around in among the rocks. And a water feature. Um, if you can do that, boy, you're ahead of the game. But a beautiful yard, fire smart. So you're always trying to interrupt the path of fire uh, horizontally and vertically. And as gardeners, that's really important because you're going to do a lot of pruning and planting. And horizontally, they've got containers uh, and gravel pathways. And vertically, we don't want to create that ladder of fire going up to the crown. So uh, both directions, horizontally and vertically. Again, um, zero scaping, uh, drought tolerant. So another thing that FireSmart has uh, is a plant program and they've uh, got it here on the landscaping hub. And you can go in to find out who has identified, which um, nurseries have identified um, FireSmart plants. So you can find, uh, put in your location there, participating stores and go for it. Uh, this one here is really cute. This is, um, this is Ember. He's the fox. Uh, he's the mascot for Firestart. Um, and Art Knapp uh, on the mainland and um, Prince George and uh, Prince George and Kamloops uh, have teamed together and They've identified all the fire smart, fire resistant plants. So hopefully uh, we'll see more partnerships like that. It sure would be nice to go into a nursery and just see everything identified for you. That would just be grand. So remember, right plant, uh, fire resistant, okay. Um, Right place, be very strategic where your trees are. Uh, start pruning, start removing. Uh, try not to create any fire ladders and uh, trees catching fire by their canopies. Spacing is critical. Right mulch, non flammable mulch, uh, especially close to your home, um, and maintenance. Now, yeah, we do want it low maintenance, but you have the biggest maintenance part is the pruning and and what happens around your home is the debris, the leaves in your gutter. Of course, if you move the trees away, you've got uh, less leaves in your in your gutters, but uh, keep it clean. So uh, I want to know how fire smart you were feeling now. So I'm going to ask you six questions. Uh, true or false? And here's the first question. Plant shrubs away from trees to avoid creating ladder fires. True or false? Plant shrubs away from trees. Now, you, I did say you could plant shrubs under trees, but there's a lot of considerations. But if you were to start off, uh, I would um, keep them low and maybe not use shrubs. So the answer to that is plant your shrubs away from trees to avoid ladder fuel. So that's true. Question two, yard maintenance is an important part of reducing accumulations of fuel. Remember, fuel is that word, fuel. You have control over the fuel in your yard, in your garden, around your home. I guess I'm giving you the answer. I kind of like that. Huh? Uh, yes, that's true. You got to do some maintenance. Three. Uh, now, this is sort of a two part. Maximum lawn height during the fire season. Here's the first part. Is fire season April to October? And the second part is 
what's the height of that you should be the, the maximum height you should cut your lawn? So do you even know when the fire season is? And I think I told you this one. I didn't tell you the fire season. Uh, the height of your lawn at the maximum is uh, four inches or 10 centimeters. And this is the fire season. It's seven months of the year. And it's because we live in this beautiful province full of trees and such. Uh, prune tree branches uh, that are, are prune tree branches. The, the grammar's not right here. Uh, that are two to three meters from the ground. If they're less than two meters, if, if they're below two meters, or three meters below the ground, do you prune them? And the answer is yes, you do. You shouldn't be able to uh, reach them. Uh, two meters up, two to three meters up, depending what's growing underneath the tree. So that's true. Fire resistant plants do not easily ignite from flames or embers and don't easily spread fire to nearby fuels. Is that true? Fire resistant plants. That is true. Fire resistant plants don't uh, ignite from flames or fire or embers and don't easily spread to the fuels. And the last one, highly flammable leaves and needles are aromatic and have a strong odor when crushed. And the highly flammable leaves are uh, the coniferous trees. Uh, Foss holly is another one. And they have a strong odor when crushed. So that is true. They were all true. So are you fire smart overwhelmed? Well, as I said, this is just an awareness. Uh, if you could remember the two triangles, the four circles and fuel and embers, I think I've done well. But here's the thing, uh, look at your property, identify some of those priorities. Um, in the short term, what can you do today? This is the year round job, just pick it up after yourself and the debris and the fuel that gathers around your home. And in the long term, what are those budgetary things you have to think about? Maybe you have to change uh, what's surrounding your house into a non-compostable uh, zone, like putting in uh, gravel and getting some of those trees cut, uh, calling an arborist to come out and actually do, do the job for you. So if you need more than this session, there is a session uh, coming up on June 16th. Uh, the CVRD is doing a Fire Smart presentation. Uh, Fire Smart program has everything you'll need. They'll do risk assessments. You can do, uh, you can create an action list. Um, they do home assessments. So uh, tons and tons of materials and experts just waiting to, to help you. Uh, so that session uh, is make a note at uh, the North Oyster Fire Department, um, June 16th from 7 to 9. And I've kept someone in the background. Um, his name is uh, Braden Osborne. Uh, he's a fire smart officer uh, here in Nanaimo. And I'm hoping that if you have any questions uh, that you can ask, uh, Braden, and, I, and I'm going to give you some uh, some airtime, uh, Braden, so that you can uh, add or fill in the blanks to what I didn't say. So thank you very much. And Braden, um, if uh, do we sh have to share a screen for uh, Braden to have uh, some time? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll see if I can start my video here. Can everyone see me as well? Yes. Perfect. Well, um, that was really great, Joanne. Um, there's, I don't, there's, I don't think there's much I really need to touch on. Um, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, the Fire Smart program is ramping up in BC in a big way. Um, there is more funding. There is more research uh, situations like last year when the town of Lytton burnt down. 
Um, those are things that remind us the importance of FireSmart. Um, and it, even unfortunately, it has given us more data. So it's sad that these events of um, tragedy and disaster keep happening, but it keeps giving us more data to evaluate um, to really ensure that the FireSmart program is exactly what it needs to be to protect people's homes and, and the community. Um, a couple of years ago, they actually realized that it was important to add the fourth um, priority zone, which is that zero to 1.5 zone away from your house. So before it was just zero to 10 meters. And so they've added that zone because they've realized how critically important it is to have that non-combustible zone around your home. So um, it is evolving, it is growing. Um, and I would really encourage any of you to reach out. You can reach out in the chat now and I can answer questions. Uh, send me an email or, or go to either of those um, websites um, and there's there's a ton of resources available uh, and I'm happy to forward any resources that anyone might need. Well, I'm just going to look in the chat here. Uh, so I see a question about once you have a fire smart assessment, can you get a break on your home insurance? So right now, a fire smart assessment will not give you a break on your home insurance. However, there is uh, something called um, a wildfire uh, risk mitigation expert, I believe. Um, there it is, uh, wildfire mitigation specialist, and they can do a home assessment as part of the home partners program. Um, and the cooperators insurance company will give you 10% off on your um, insurance. So that's um, a great way to do that, but there's not a lot of those specific wildfire mitigation specialists, at least in the area where I am. Um, so it's, it can be challenging to find those people. We're working on training more and getting more so that we can offer that. Um, yeah. How fire smart are rotos? Rotos are, to my understanding, um, fire resistant, like anything, if it's dry enough in the summer, like with the heat wave last year or the heat dome, they're not, they're not going to survive. Uh, come a fire, but they are resistant. Typically, like the oily leaf, leafy plants are um, fire resistant, um, typically. Um, I have large coniferous trees on our property. Do you worry about trunks at all? Um, so large diameter wood uh, is not necessarily it's not something that we're normally concerned about when it comes to fire smarting a property. Um, I come from a structural firefighter background. And so even in um, large timber frame structures, we're not concerned about those timbers um, lighting on fire and becoming a huge risk. It takes a really long time for fire to burn through um, a, like a big tree or a big, um, a big beam, whether it's an engineered beam or just um, milled uh, wood. We're really concerned about the smaller um, like branches or um, just the pine needles, especially the debris on the ground, because that is what supports a really rapid moving um, fire. And then that puts off all the radiant heat. From my experience on the island, the kinds of fires that we see are, are slower moving and they're ground fire and they don't always get into a crown. Um, and it might burn around a trunk of a tree on all the, on the deadfall. So like the pine needles, pine cones, things like that, and may not even burn up the tree at all. It will burn around it and just keep going on the ground until either we stop it, it rains, or, um, or it puts itself out depending on the conditions. Um, so I wouldn't worry about the trunks, but pruning up that six meter or six feet um, to stop it from becoming ladder fuel so that the fuels on the ground can't get into the canopy, which ends up turning into a crown fire. And then you have a crown fire, which is a ton of embers that will spread. Uh, so I hope that answers that one. Um, and the list of plants, are the plants that need less water more fire resistant than those that need more water or are they all equally fire resistant? I don't know. Uh, that would be a question I would uh, leave for Joanne. Um, do you know that one? Well, when I started looking at the terminology and I looked at drought resistant, um, it made me think that they might recover better. Uh, okay. But uh, a lot of the plants that were recommended are native plants and they tend to be drought resistant. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, what specifically was the question? Um, In the list of plants, are the plants oh. that need less water more fire resistant than those that need more water? Or are they all oh. equally fire resistant? They could be equally fire, it depends what you choose. Yeah. 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 It's just a different kind of plant, uh, the drug mm -hmm. resistant versus, because there are a lot of perennials and annuals that are just, they're great for your garden and they're fire resistant. So yeah. it's just, just a different way of talking about the plants, but they were both in the vein of being fire smart. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there is, um, I know the regional district in Nanaimo has put out a water smart and fire smart uh, joint manual and so it has plants that are both drought resistant and fire smart um, on them according to the list the rotos are not fire resistant that could be the case it was it's my understanding that rotos are fire resistant but i could be wrong well right now i would go by the list uh, unless all the rotos were left standing. Yeah. <laughs> Again, um, within reason, I mean, res fire resistant doesn't mean fireproof still, right? So you could still have a home that in extreme heat, a fire resistant plant could be the thing that catches on fire and does end up burning your home down. Exactly. And, and Kate there, uh, she did say she did a quick uh, Google search and it says they're fire resistant. So I guess it depends what list you're looking at. Uh, yeah. They may vary. So uh, that's a learning right there. Yeah. On one end of my home is a coniferous forest. A fire came through a creek ravine in my area, lake couch, and I think I would be in trouble. Otherwise, my home is surrounded by um, a meter and a half of gravel. Yeah. So again, going back to kind of what the geography is around your home that does affect how a fire um, will move and so if if there is a creek and ravine or a box canyon th those are things to be concerned about in your area um, but again if if your home and in those priority zones like out into um, the 30 meters and 100 meters if that can be as fire smart as possible um, that's really mitigating the risk of, um, of having a, a disastrous wildfire come through. Um, as for another question, my home backs onto a regional park with large deciduous trees. There's lots of deadfall and debris. Should the CVRD clear this out? Um, everywhere is different. Every situation is different. Um, I know there's money out there for um, uh, local governments and regional districts, municipalities to look at doing fuel management prescriptions in parks and in publicly owned lands. So they might already have a plan for something like that. In the regional district of Nanaimo, where I work, I'm working with parks right now to look at a few different hotspots, some areas that are concerning to us that do back onto homes. So um, you could reach out and, and share your concern, but um, there, might be, there might be a situation in that case where it doesn't need to be um, just because of the landscape um, but it, it's a question you could ask, but I couldn't say whether, yes, it needs to be done or no, it, it doesn't need to be done without, without seeing it. Um, I have two wasp sprinklers on my house. Our fire smart community did a sprinkler test during fire smart week. That's fabulous. Um, one thing I do say about the sprinklers is it's not a silver bullet and it's not a substitution for having a fire smart property. Um, you have to have a water system to run a sprinkler. And in the case of a wildfire coming into your community, you may not have access to your water, whether you're on a well and your power is out, that's quite likely. Um, whether the fire department is using the hydranted water supply, um, which gives you no water pressure for your sprinklers. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why it may not end up working or um, yeah, so the best thing that you can do is really take, take into account the actual priority zones and, and have sprinklers as a, a secondary um, measure of protection for your home. Um, percentages of human versus lightning caused fires. So I actually was on a call with the BC Wildfire Service and one of the stats they were sharing was 65% um, of... Um, oh, I have to get this right. I better look that up really quickly. Okay, you look that up. I, I just want to comment on Kate Lowe's comment. 
Sadly, we are encouraged to plant trees to combat global warming, and now we're trying to eliminate them. Yep, it's uh, it's a conundrum we've got ourselves in, that's for sure. Um, but I'm thinking the more trees we have, no, I'm not even going to add to it. It's just a conundrum. It is. Um, I know that in last year, um, we, the wildfires alone, uh, I think contributed to three times the industrial output of carbon for the entire year in BC. So just from the wildfires. So they do have an impact and it is a lot of, it's a lot of carbon getting released and the fires are getting bigger and bigger. So there is concern for that for sure. Yeah. Yes, there are fire smart trees and it, it depends on how you space them. It doesn't mean we're living without trees. Uh, and and mm. fire smart is about protecting your property. Um, I think we've got to put that into perspective. I'm looking at some of the comments. Uh, and you know, you don't need to put gravel against your house. You can use compost, Jackie. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't need gravel, but if you're in a real low maintenance kind of gardener, you can use gravel. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely like to see that in one point one, yeah, one and a half meters non-combustible zone, like that is what I'm really trying to get people to focus on because if your home can't catch on fire, yes. it's not going to burn. Um, and so really focusing on that really close in area to your home, um, because it's, it really is your number one priority as you're looking at the priority of your entire property. Um, the, with what happened in Lytton, the wildfire came through and the fires in the town burnt independently of the wildfire. So the wildfire had already gone through and each home caught on fire because the home next to them caught on fire and the stores burnt down because the store next to them burnt down. And so if they had been built with the fire smart principles or had been fire smarted within that um, one and a half uh, non-combustible zone, they may have had um, a better outcome. So, Can I ask, ask you this question? Was the town, did they receive any education on being a fire smart community? Beforehand, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I really think neighborhoods, mm. uh, people who live in uh, around a lot of trees and on acreages, they got to get together and start thinking about creating that um, mm. uh, pruning uh, out to that 100 meter area so that it creates a bit of a fire break before they start coming into the communities. And Totally. It's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different um, factors that come into play and a lot of different things that um, the municipalities can do and that neighborhoods can do themselves. I mean, organize uh, cleanup days. Um, if, if, if neighborhoods are proactive, the regional districts can bring more resources to bear. If there's groups of people who are proactive and are reaching out for support, <laughs> Um, it's hard to get people excited about things like that. Everyone feels like they're busy and overwhelmed lately. Um, but it's a great opportunity to kind of bring back that sense of community because I think we've lost that since COVID. Um, everyone should, should know their neighbors and, and get together once in a while um, outside of FireSmart. But FireSmart is a great excuse to get everybody together, have a barbecue, um, and make some positive change in, in your own have, neighborhoods. Have a FireSmart barbecue. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I did, I wrote that down, um, the natural causes uh, versus human caused fires. So 60% natural causes. So 60% lightning and then 35% human caused. And that was last year. And then 5% are undetermined at this time or under investigation. So um, it's about 60, 40. So just a little over half of natural caused essentially. Uh, but that's still that's still a lot of fires. Um, I think there was almost 2000 fires last year in British Columbia. Um, so that's almost a thousand um, human caused. And that's not including municipalities uh, that have fire protection. That's only including forested land or fires that BC for wildfire service attended. I just wanted to add one comment. Uh, I was talking to uh, my sister, and she lives in Charlottetown, PEI, about fire smart. Well, they don't live in big forested areas like this. She said, you know, she didn't know a lot about it other than uh, we started talking about mulch. And 
you don't have to live around a lot of trees to uh, be fire smart. They had mulch around an apartment building and a lot of people went out smoking and then mm. the cigarette gets in the mulch yeah. and uh, then the fire, uh, then the apartment burned and that happened more than once. So uh, all of us can identify with being fire smart no matter where we live, in a forest, in suburbia, wherever. Uh, be vigilant. Yeah, we all have a part to play. Um, and whether it's when you go camping, being really careful with your campfire. Um, if, if you smoke, making sure that you put your butt somewhere safe. Um, yeah, it's, it's all within our control to, to make a real sizable difference, um, both in our communities and in the province as a whole. Um, and not just with wildfires, but home fires as well. I mean, um, yeah, I, I noticed another question, human caused more in populated areas. I don't know about that. Um, I would assume it's likely that there's a correlation between uh, more human caused fires um, re in relation to where more people are, but that would just be a guess on my part. I'm not sure. Well, you know, they do talk about uh, ATVs going out into mm -hmm. the backwoods and then they have mud and uh, dried grasses that ignite from the, the mufflers and things. So mm -hmm. they, can, they can cause them in pretty remote locations as well. Certainly. Um, yeah. But it's, I would assume that if there's there's probably more on that interface uh, where you have the wildland uh, mm -hmm. not too far from um, population. Um, thank you, thank you, Joanne, so much. That was really informative, great information. Um, thank you everybody for attending and hope to see you next month, July 11th.